Is Noco can you buy can you buy it at stores in the US? You can buy it online on Amazon. You can get them at most gyms. And then you can get bear bells almost anywhere now. So. But they're not like in uh, any kind of grocery stores, targets, anything like that. Yeah. We were in H E B, but not right now. But you can get it at your local affiliate. Maybe. Potentially. And now new flavor. Okay. Um <laughs> got a basically a weekly check-in show here. Uh Patrick is in jail, it looks like. And um <laughs> Bella just took a shower, and I have not showered since working out. But either either way, <coughs> we'll be ready to go. We might have a guest joining us here in a minute, um, and so it, when, if that happens, then we'll uh, kind of derail what we're talking about. But otherwise, we're gonna just re- kind of catch up on what happened this past week. Um, I think we'll probably. Patrick, are you even there? <laughs> so scared. It's because he's in jail. Like they don't have good service behind bars. In a concrete bunker. Uh, I was home this past weekend. I had a super kind of chill and relaxing weekend. Bella, you were on the road um, up in North Dakota. You kind of talked about it a little bit last week um, for the Able Games. And maybe you can, well, we'll put that on hold actually for a second. Laws, what's up, man? Hey, how's it going? That microphone. Setup you have there looks like it's from the 1950s. Yeah, Suits that's you. pretty much what I got for me. <laughs> Laws Casper um, with Forged Competitions. You may have previously known him <laughs> from uh, running the Iron Games, which has been rebranded and uh, also has a new competition this upcoming week in the Rocky Mountain Classic, which if you follow along with our um, world tour calendar is listed on our calendar when we first dropped the world tour dates. Uh, for this 12-month period of time, uh, we mentioned that there were a couple that were on there that we wouldn't potentially be at, but, oh, oh, sorry, no problem, Dagger. Well, quick, we'll get you next time. Um, that we weren't going to necessarily be at, but we did want to uh, kind of include and highlight on there, uh, and the Rocky Mountain Classic is one of those. So we invited Laws on today to talk to us a little bit about what that competition is and uh, maybe also a little bit about the rebrand. Yeah. I don't know if you'd rather start with one or the other there, Laws. What's what's going on? Can any, can you guys hear me? I can hear you, Brian. I can hear you now. I apologize. You also hear a ice cream truck? <laughs> Laws, did you hear what I asked you? I didn't. I apologize. My my uh, computer cut out there right at the end. Okay. Um, basically, I was just going to give you the option if you wanted to talk about the rebrand to you there. Yes. So I, um, so I am partnered with my good friend, Brigham Nielsen. Um, and for the last five years, we had been running, um, what was called the iron games. And we did that through, uh, a local. Summer advisement from a couple, including yourself, Brian, uh, we decided to make a big change and move from Southern Utah up to Northern Utah. And in doing so, um, we were unable to take the name, the Iron Games with us um, as it was owned in, by the Utah Summer Games. And so we made a big change in kind of our style and what we wanted to accomplish in the uh, So we decided to do events, starting with CrossFit events, um, the first of which is now um, going from the Iron Games is now going to be called the Summit Games. Um, and that will be hosted in the Salt Lake City area in the first weekend of October for the next five years. And then we just added in January of 2024, the Rocky Mountain Classic. And Rocky Mountain Classic is coming up this weekend. Came out an um, array of different events. So nice. Um, I'm not sure, but laws. It seems like your internet's kind of coming in and out. At least to me, Bella, is that happening for you too? <clears throat> I apologize. Yeah. Not the greatest here. Okay, well, it's okay right now. Um, so you, so you guys have. Uh, well, that uh, makes sense with the um, 
the rebrand for Iron Games, obviously with the the way that you explained it there. And I and I when you say that you're going to have that competition, the Summit Games, first weekend of October in Salt Lake City for five years, like all of those things are already locked in. Yeah. So we uh, the venue that we're we're being hosted at is um, called the Real um, Academy. So uh, the Real Salt Lake is um, a soccer. I don't even know if they have the same practice facility that they um, host their um, up and coming athletes and then their, their teams at, and they reached out to us and said, I think we have the perfect place for you. Um, so 150,000 square foot inside for the summit games. Um, and yeah. then five soccer fields outside that we'll be able to use in the future. And then a 2,500 seated arena outdoors, outdoor arena that we'll be able to use as the time goes in, um, it all started um, with them reaching out to us. Well, that's always a huge plus when someone reaches out to you in that front, because, you know, finding venues and locations to host these competitions can often be challenging. Soccer in the United States in general has, um, you know, kind of been growing over the past decade or so, adding new teams, improved facilities, bringing in international players. So I am sure that they have some really nice stuff there. And like you said, a lot of different space and potentially some opportunity for creativity within the programming. And of course, knowing that you're going to be in the same place for a series of years, it really allows you to potentially lean on even some stuff that, uh, you know, Dave Castro has talked about the history of the CrossFit game. Sometimes he has an idea for a workout or, a, you know, a place yeah. to do something, but it just isn't right. Then. I think in one case, <clears throat> he said that he had the idea for the standard workout a decade before he put programmed it at the games. Um, last year, <clears throat> I think you guys had Adrian Conway doing the programming for the iron games. Um, will anything be similar or different in that regard going forward? Or have you not, maybe not decided yet? Um, we've decided to, uh, stay connected with Adrian Conway and true fitness. And so, um, we've started into the initial beginnings of it all programming. Uh, we've, you know, with this new partnership with um, the Zions Bank Real Academy, the idea is to try to say, hey, um, for the Summit Games. And so, you know, with how much space we'll have available to us, um, we're, we're really excited for that. But for the Rocky Mountain Classic, um, I partnered with my really good friend, uh, Nick Burns from Underdog Athletics, and we, we programmed that together. And this, um, the competition that's coming up this weekend, uh, my understanding is that it's a teams only competition. Uh, sorry, you're going to have to say that again. I apologize again on my end for the Rocky, Rock, the, the Rocky picture. Mountain Classic. It's, it's teams only, correct? Correct. So teams of two, um, the idea was there that we were planning to add that for the summit games and we wanted to test the waters. And so, um, the Rocky Mountain Classic was a great place to start that. Very small um, this year, but there's a lot of things that having a second event allows us to we put on. Yeah, and I do remember seeing this a few months ago. Is that in a post is from February that kind of brought this under my radar is a percentage of regist of I think it's the registrations goes directly towards the prize purse for each division. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, you know, we've always tried to find a really good way to give the athletes what they deserve for coming out. Um, we always want to give back to the community and uh, finding a way to try to drive registration. Was it, this was a big thing that we came upon and decided that we're going to go all in, even though this event came out and, uh, came into our lap maybe four months ago. Um, we decided to really decide to put the funds into it and make it happen. So, you know, as it gets down there to the intermediate percentages, you know, um, but it is something to be able to hold a check and say, like, I got something out of this is, is a huge deal. Yeah. And I think it's cool. You know, you see many competitions where obviously, uh, the the bulk of the competitors are in maybe the lower levels in terms of ability, 
um, and they're not getting, you know, necessarily a prize purse. So this is a nice way to kind of work that um, the representation into kind of the, the payout at the end of the weekend and also have that kind of a dovetail with your other event. Um, obviously, it was not rebranded at the time of this post, but to be able to earn an entry into the competition that's, you know, six months later on in the year. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the big reason that we decided to make that move was to really have an established base of community. And events have that. Um, you look at um, Wadapuza, for instance, um, Granite Games was a big inspiration for us. Um, and those really centered around the specific area they were in and the gyms that were there. And so by moving to Salt Lake, um, that's kind of the idea to get them more involved. And so by giving them that spot, they're able to, um, we're able to provide more opportunities for them in the future. And as far as um, as this weekend goes, you know, for this year for Rocky Mountain Classic, if anyone wants to keep up to date with what's going on there, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, the best way to do that is just through that Instagram, um, Rocky Mountain Classic. Um, the best. Really excited for actually um, this event is putting the name Rocky Mountain Classic. Um, but what we're doing with it in the future is what we're most excited for. And that's actually going to be a age group and adaptive event specific. So only those uh, competitors in the future years. This was just to establish the name, the branding and such um, to be able to get that out there. And so starting in 2025, we're moving to make it an age group and adaptive. event and then the, uh, the last thing i wanted to ask you about was just um forged competitions in general you know it's something that you've kind of uh, I, I believe kind of redirected your life to put a, a big emphasis on this company this year and so if you just wanted to say a little bit about that decision personally or from a business perspective what we can kind of expect uh going forward yeah um brigham and i are um and so as we're moving forward we're looking to build and grow um different events of a variety of uh ways whether it's through the elite competition so providing more opportunities for elite competitors to get uh, compensation for their abilities or even to smaller level local events from idaho utah and into nevada and really trying to provide this area um high top-notch quality events Awesome, man. Well, I know you got a tight schedule this week, big, you know, competition week uh, up, upcoming, and it was a late invite to ask you here, but I want to give opportunity to say a little bit about what you guys are up to. Um, if you're in the area, you know, check it out. would be a lot of opportunities to compete through these guys in the upcoming um, years. And this weekend, uh, Rocky Mountain Classic is going down. So good luck to all the competitors, volunteers, et cetera, that you guys have out there. And we will be involved with the Summit Games um, late in the fall as well. So we'll be seeing laws later on in the year. But thank you for taking the time today, man. Okay. That's my biggest fear. That is my biggest fear <laughs> is getting my internet just completely cutting off. And it's happened. I think anytime we go a podcast over like 90 minutes, my internet just stops. But it is truly my biggest fear. Yeah, I apologize for that. <clears throat> I mean, I think that we got the gist of the message there. Laws is a great guy. Um, so next time we'll, we'll make him go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make him go somewhere else. <clears throat> I mean, well, that you know, you know, it's just, it is what it is. It's happened. It happens sometimes. But uh, Rocky Mountain, the cutting out is so timely, you would almost think it's. <laughs> well, Pat's back. So they were obviously sharing Wi Fi. Yeah, we can only host one of them at a time. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, Rocky Mountain Classics happening this weekend. Um, and uh, especially if you're in the West Coast, those are good guys to just have on your radar. Uh, as you can see, they've recommitted to um, an investment there from um, <laughs> from the competition perspective. And we'll be providing those opportunities of different um, athletes and groups of people over the next couple of years. Um, so good, good people to be aware of. Give them a follow. Rocky Mountain Classic, Forge Competition, Summit Games on Instagram. Um, so Bella, last week you guys, you were in North Dakota, yes. um, place that maybe not that many people traveled to for the able games fourth year, I believe of the competition. 
Um, and just in case anyone kind of missed it last week, uh, could you just give us like a, what is this competition all about? Yeah, so it's kind of the culmination of every year what the people at TNT and the Able Games Foundation is doing. So it's they put on a competition for athletes with special needs and they partner them with able athletes. There's also an RX competition, there's an intermediate competition. So there really is complete inclusivity. So whatever kind of level of fitness you are or whatever your ID may be, you can compete here and there's an opportunity for you to do so. I love it truly because I think, you know, sometimes we forget that fitness isn't just for the elites, it's for everyone. And it gives all of these, you know, kids, adults, um, an opportunity to compete. And a lot of times these athletes are in schools where they don't have any sort of physical education programs. And so what the mission is here is raising money so that they can put these physical education programs in their schools. That's my guy, Noah. Love Noah. Um, uh, and so it's, it's so fun and so rewarding and getting to go back every year has been really special for me because the kids remember me, I remember them. And so they feel, you know, just extra loved on when people continue to come back and show up and support them. So it's, it's one of my favorite, uh, competitions that I get to go to throughout the year. Have you been all four years? I've been the last three. So the first year, um, I, it was 2021, I believe it was the first year, but I've been the last three. If I you know, knew it existed in 2021, I absolutely would have been there, but it's continuing to get better. So the first year they had it outside and it was very small. It was outside in, so in Fargo, it's a very interesting little town. It's very small, uh, but they have this cute little downtown town center. And I mean little in every possible way with the turf and it's outside this hotel. And so that's where it was in the beginning. And then they moved it to an arena and then they moved it to the college. And then this year it was at a hockey rink. And so the entire hockey rink was taken over for this competition. Framework came in, set up a rogue rig. They had an athlete area where everybody could put their stuff. There was families. It really is a well-run competition. We were on time. I will also say whole thing was on time, both days, it's two day competition and we were on time. And so I think, being able to have so many people that come in there and volunteer time. And this is like me, this is my you know actual profession and job and showing up there. It means a lot to the families, I, honestly, even more than the kids probably. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, being on time goes a long way when, when, <laughs> when running competitions and hockey yeah. rinks, you know, <clears throat> hockey rinks or arenas have been used for CrossFit competitions, um, over the years, I mean, we saw it, uh, yeah. one of the competitions there at Arizona State was on like a little hockey rink, but also the Granite Games have done it hockey, hockey rinks in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so not necessarily uncommon. And if you are running competitions and maybe looking for some alternative options, they can work pretty well. Um, yeah. Any any kind of highlights, stories, standout moments from this year at the Able Games you want to share? Oh my goodness. Well, I think it's always fun to kind of see the same faces and something that to me, it's challenging to see, but also it shows how much of an impact you have is a lot of these kids and adults mentally, they're very much the same when you see them year over year and they don't mature a ton. And that's, you know, there's not, not a lot that can be done with that, but physically they look older. And so you get to see them and you're watching them grow up and you're growing up with them and they love you so much more every time you see them. I can't tell any, I think going through competition, it's always funny because you're there and they just want to give you a hug in the middle of the workout. And I'm like, no, 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 just keep going, just keep going. But they, they just want to love on you. And so it's fun to be there when the kids just want to give you hugs. And then sometimes they have a little bit of a breakdown in the middle of an event and you know them because you have that relationship with them. So I find myself, I'll be doing push ups in the middle of a competition. I'll be doing, you know, burpees, whatever it looks like to get these athletes across the finish line. That's the goal. So my job, I mean, it always looks a little different every time I'm there. It's, you know, my job is to go there and talk about it, but also same time I'm helping them move through these competitions. I would say I am always impressed. They had five workouts and that is a, that's a big weekend of fitness for yeah. most people. Yeah. So to do five workouts in two days, and all of the kids had smiles on the entire time. They all had fun. I think that, you know, it reminds you of why you're doing these competitions, especially for them. 
I would say, you know, the podium doesn't really matter as much. A lot of times the people just give back anything that they've been given and put it right back into the program. But I know some of the kids get a little sad when they, uh, when they don't podium and they cry and it's like, well, that's not why we're here. It's okay. It's okay. But it's still, you know, that competitive spirit, they want to win. And then they, there was one girl, she's so cute. She starts crying before the last event. She goes, I'm not going to podium. That's okay. That's not the point. That's okay. It's totally fine. And I think that, you know, everybody gets sad when they compete and they don't podium and you, you don't realize that's the universal feeling. Everybody wants to win. But if you tell them, you know, that's not actually winning, winning is showing up and being here for you today, it reframes it and then they smile and then there's no more tears. So, how many? So, you're saying that's the type of Fargo? Um, so, it's one to Minneapolis. And if you make it, you go from Minneapolis to Fargo. <laughs> Two years ago, I didn't make it. So my flight from Austin to Minneapolis, totally on time, totally fine. I land in Minneapolis. I get off my flight. I'm looking around and there is nothing on the departures saying we're going to Fargo. Confused what's happening. So I go up to the counter and say, hey, I'm supposed to be on a flight in an hour and a half going to Fargo. He goes, sorry, it's 10 p.m. Everything's canceled. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I have to go. What do you want me to do? I'm in Minneapolis. This isn't North Dakota. And so about an hour and a half later, so my flight should have already been taken off. I finally get in with someone and they're like, yeah, you know, no flights going out. You could possibly go to Grand Rapids tomorrow. That's wildly unhelpful. Competition started. I needed to be there at like 630. So what I ended up doing at about 12, a little bit later, like midnight, it was already the next day. I got a rental car and I drove from Minneapolis to Fargo and I got in around 330 in the morning was up at the venue by six and we just did the day. So it's only two flights, but you got to make the second one. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah, not, not the easiest place to get to necessarily. No, it's not, but I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. And I think a lot of people continue to show up. And I think Connor McGovern, the fact that he's so involved and this is his project is beautiful because he has so much more of a reach than I could ever imagine being an NFL player. So I love that. Big shout out to Matt O'Keefe for coming as well. So people who have an influence are using it in the right way. And I appreciate that. Yeah. I, mean, I, I spoke to Matt last week prior to him going there and he was super excited about it. It's, uh, you know, it's something he doesn't have to go to, but he, he wants to go to and he makes it a point like you do to, to be involved yeah. year after year. Um, he's good friends with Connor, I think. <clears throat> and, you know, O'Keefe's a big guy, but man, Connor makes him look small. <laughs> <laughs> so we were actually, this is actually the best thing. So we were talking, Connor's massive. I mean, Connor's huge. We did a workout together and it was machine based and I'm trying to keep up with Connor. And then Connor's telling me that he's trying to keep up with me. And I'm like, dude, no, on a machine, come on. And then we were sharing an echo bike and it got stuck in the height. So I just assumed I was going on his height. He assumed it was stuck on my height. So neither of us were on the correct height on this echo bike. And we're just, we're both just trying to figure it out. But we were talking, myself, O'Keefe, and Connor, about our love of Diet Coke. And if you don't know, like, I love a cold DC. It's my beverage of choice. And apparently Connor does as well. And O'Keefe was sharing with us that he's completely cut out Diet Coke in Coke Zero to train for the Boston Marathon. And that is incredibly impressive. And I, I'm inspired, but it's not one of those challenges that I'm going to take on. I love, I love the marathon or the no diet Coke. I think you could probably convince me to train for a marathon. If Dom programmed marathon training, I wouldn't question it. It's like, all right, we're doing it. Whatever Dom says goes, but he lets me drink diet Coke. So if, again, if Dom says it's okay, we're going to, we're going to keep going. So more you're like doing the run, call. run a marathon, then go with a week without diet Coke. <laughs> It's tough. I don't know. I mean, one life is worse than the other. And I think life running is just <laughs> e. <laughs> PC. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. I didn't know what to say. Um, no, Bella, I was like, I haven't, I've been working on a story, but uh, actually this, this week's friend of the week is actually Connor McGovern. I love him. He's so that's guy. why cool. I didn't even know you were doing that. Nice, Patrick. Yeah. So the reason why it's like the friend of the week just doesn't have to be, it's just someone that just 
it's just having a good effect on fitness for the week. And then the more and more I looked into it, it's just hard to pick one person, you know, especially when a competition where the results really don't matter, like you said, Bella, but who better than someone like Connor and those who don't know Connor, Connor, he actually has a background in CrossFit. Yes. He's the starting center for the New York jets, but he's been, you know, he kind of founded, I mean, I don't know for sure, but he, he worked out with Brooke Wells at CrossFit Fringe in Columbia, Missouri, when he was at the University of Mizzou. He actually competed at Wadapalooza one year. I have to look. I think it was 2020 in the weightlifting, uh, Olympic weightlifting competition. And he's uh, – Oh, was it – that was the um, – like the weightlifting face-off where they use the Sinclair yes, totals? I believe so. <clears throat> and if you go to his Instagram, the guy is an Olympic lifting fiend. And, you, you know, to see him move around – as an NFL player, as a starting center for the Jets, you can, you know, he's like a perfect example where like fitness isn't just strength. It's, you know, especially for the NFL, it's like functional fitness. And, you know, he's, he's a guy that believes in CrossFit. I don't know how much CrossFit he actually does, but um, I know he has a lot of the, you know, he still does like echo bike. He does a lot of, you know, stuff like that. I don't think he's doing per se like CrossFit classes, but I think he, the general methodology he follows, but it's, it's just really cool to see that. And, uh, and of course his relationship with Fraser and, and with O'Keefe and, uh, the dancers, obviously he has a really good connection with Jen and Sam and, uh, you know, so yeah, just really cool. That, it's really cool. And he's great. Yeah. He's awesome. If that, if that was the year 2020, I think that year a lot was maybe my, like, that was such a good year. It was right before, you know, it was the middle of sanctionals right before everything kind of got shut down, but Velner, Tia won that year. Mayhem won that year. They had the weightlifting sh uh, face-off, which ended with Matt Rattay versus Jared. I can never remember his last name, but it was they put on a show. It was amazing uh, on the stage at Bayside there. And then they had the um, WZA Strong that Rob Orlando was running as well, which um, <clears throat> actually our friend uh, Raf Perret has competed and wrote an article about him that year with Chad Schroeder. Um, that, was, that was a great year in Miami. I didn't know that Connor competed there. Connor's awesome. You guys should have him on the show. He's a good, he's a good chat too. He's funny. Well, when now that we feature him as friend of the week, I think we have has to. open door policy to invite him on the show <laughs> for sure. Um, so that was able games. Yep. Uh, you know, go check it out on Instagram. Patrick was scrolling through the pictures there. I'm sure they'll post some other stuff. Um, but yeah, the people that we know that who've been involved, um, including Bella, of course, have a great time there. Uh, it's a really cool thing that they provide. Um, up there in North Dakota. And, you know, um, maybe that's a, a place that, if, if, especially if you're a charity minded person, um, it's a, it's not, I mean, it's a small town, but it's kind of a cool place to visit and uh, maybe go volunteer or help out with them in the future. That, that would be a cool thing to do. I mean, he's a big dude. I think he said he was 305 right now. Yeah, I haven't spent that much time, you know, like uh, CrossFitters, sometimes they have like their competition weight and they're like regular weight during their life. I'm sure NFL players have something similar, but yeah, this just, I was actually at the gym today. I was talking with Andy Hendel, who used to play in the NFL and, you know, he was talking about just some people that he's known throughout his life. And he's like, big people are just big people. Yeah. <laughs> they're big and they're strong. And so perfect. Lift some weights, man. This I like cool. it. It's impressive. Yeah, this is really cool. <clears throat> All right. Um, I know, Patrick, I sent you a couple of things, but I think we can kind of just let's just jump into kind of the biggest thing that happened this past week, which was the team quarterfinals going down. Um, there was some kind of uh, I don't even know if I want to call it a controversy or not throughout the day yesterday with just a lot of people, I would say, expressing some sort of frustration about not being able to know which athletes are competing on which team. Um, over the years, I think that in general, CrossFit Games and their website has done a better job of creating an opportunity for you to easily see who's on each team. Um, but when the scores were first put up on Saturday, the first round of scores, there were no teammates listed at all. Um, and then the following, uh, when, the, when the final leaderboard was done, same thing, no teammates were listed there. Um, <clears throat> I kind of took it upon myself to uh, seek out um, to try to find out not just who was on the team, but who actually was competing for these teams. Um, and we'll look at a spreadsheet that I made basically yesterday, I mean, six hours or something. I was able to get a lot of information uh, that can kind of show you that. But later in the day, 
um, CrossFit did update the team rosters. And so as you can see here with the Peak 360 team, their six teammates are listed. The, when you go to the different teams, you may see some teams that have a designated team captain. You'll see some teams that have four or five or six people. If uh, that's just, you know, they can choose to have four, then they have no alternates, which is kind of risky because if something happens to someone, then you're out. Um, five would be you have either a male or female alternate, but not both. <clears throat> and six would be that you have both. Um, it does not designate who actually competed during the quarterfinals on these uh, on these teams. For the teams that Patrick's click on here, these are the best teams in the world so far this year, and we know who's competing on those teams. But for a lot of the other ones, especially if they have six athletes, it's not always that obvious. The next best clue that you could potentially get would be to go to their open scores. You can see the top four, top two men, top two women for each team, um, and, uh, and just kind of guess based on who has the best scores there. But I was able to get most of them, Mike Halpin ran a um, one of these things that he does, program that he writes to basically take all this information and put it into a usable format in one place. Um, but it, again, there's no way for him to know who is actually competing. Uh, when we look at the spreadsheet and kind of see the teams that are in qualifying positions right now, I only have the teams that are the teammates that competed or the ones that I believe competed, depending on the color coding. And he has taken some information from there, but he's also looking for some help. So if you are a team who is competing, especially if you've advanced to the next stage, which would be the semifinals, um, he's actually made that public. And I think that teams can even go in and, and potentially color coordinate uh, green and yellow, green being that they're um, actually competing and yellow that they're not. <clears throat> Patrick, you can close that comment on the right side of your screen there. I, I fixed it. Um, but this is uh yeah this is the sheet that i made yesterday and we're gonna i guess yeah let's start here patrick let's start in the west because uh one of our one of our cohorts here is out west and knows a lot about these guys maybe um so basically what you're looking at here uh both of the lists are the same in order this is from basic maybe an hour hour and a half ago i updated it to reflect the ever-changing leaderboard that uh, reviews and appeals and uh, penalties etc are ongoing we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute um, but this is the list of teams in order. And, and the green means that I got confirmation from that team or someone associated with that team of the four athletes competing. The yellow is less confirmed. Um, sometimes I'm making an assumption there because I just didn't hear back from them. But you see most of them are in green. So if you're curious who's competing on those teams, you can take some screenshots or whatever here and you can see who those people are. Um, <clears throat> the points is in the middle. And then we'll talk about the right in a second. But uh, Bella, right at the top, two Invictus teams, one and two, another one there in 11, and I, I can't remember, did they have a fourth team? And nine. No, nine and 11, yeah, so four teams in the top 11. I think you know all of these people pretty well. Um, what would you, I mean, pick, pick and choose, whichever teams, whichever athletes you want to talk about, but, uh, if, you know, if you've spoken to them or if you saw them do any of these workouts or just thoughts about the, the Invictus teams in general this year. You're muted, by, by the way. Bella, you're muted. My AirPods disconnected. I I felt left out that I didn't have any tech issues today. Um, so, so I do know that Unconquerable did repeat some of the work they repeat. And I think that was to their benefit. Um, obviously, they were initially below the other team, Unbroken. Yeah. Then they repeat the workouts went very well for them. And so now they're setting one and two. I think the team, including Hannah Black, is very solid. I think it's tough when you don't always train together to bring in someone new from the outside, someone who's not with your actual programming company. But I think the team with Phil, Roldan, Emily, and Hannah, they actually ended up having pretty solid team chemistry. And Hannah is, I mean, she's down for whatever. Whatever you throw at her, she's gonna figure it out. She's got a great coach with Micah at Brute now. And so he's plugged a lot of holes for her. So I was, you know, I was excited to see her on a team. I think she's a freak team athlete. So seeing them on top of the leaderboard, no surprise to me. Now that it's official that the Invictus one team is who it is, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, having Josh, Chandler, Lauren, and Jesse, not Devin, that was obviously in the works for a long time. Um, and I think, I mean, Jesse's done the best she possibly could to be on that team. And I think she's likely the fittest she's ever been. 
So I'm excited for them there as well. I'm also very much still excited for Devin to be on this individual journey this season. I think she would have been a phenomenal asset to team one, but I think individual will be a good time for her too. Yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> when you look at the, the global leaderboard and you see the results that peak 360s put up and some other people in the sport have kind of uh, highlighted the fact that the winning team for the game since quarterfinals has started on the team side has been first or second in the open and peak 360 taking the top spot invictus this top team being second place and kind of uh i would say right behind them but like still kind of considerably behind them um yeah. you know these guys really well uh I still yeah. think that this team can, like, you cannot count this team out as a potential team that could upset that peak 360 team at the games. Invictus won with Josh and Chandler? Yeah. Absolutely. I think the battle at the games in Fort Worth will be between Invictus one and peak 360. And I don't want to say who I'm, who I think will do better. I think hearing how excited Noah is and knowing the females on that team, knowing Tola, there's just something about them that makes me excited and it really lights a fire in me to hear that they're on a team together. When I remember learning about that team, my first thought was, I don't know anyone that can beat them. I don't, yeah. I truly don't. And so, you know, obviously Invictus one is also a phenomenal team. So I do think it'll go one and two and the point spread will be very close. And then three will be as close as they can possibly get. But as you're seeing on the actual, you know, global leaderboard i don't think three will be as close um when we get time to it down in Mad in not madison in fort worth yeah i mean there's uh there's some other teams that we'll see i mean i, I think that there are a lot of actually qu quite experienced teams in the team competition this year that realize um the most important part of quarterfinals was making it the semifinals and what i mean by that is Make sure our videos are in place. Make sure we move really well. Just do the job. If we finish first or 10th or whatever, it doesn't matter. And then reevaluate for semis. And that there really are some teams out there that did this weekend one and done as like uh, without much training preparation for it. Like they didn't taper necessarily for this to do this. Um, but their main focus was on the process of making sure that they did want the workout one time, did it well, had an, had the cameras, had every met all the, you know, requirements from CrossFit, which we'll talk about here <clears throat> in a second, because there were some teams disqualified from the season this year. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but I have the, I just want to throw this idea out there because it's in my mind. And I guess this is for Be Friendly Fitness. This is just the week of Adrian Conway. We mentioned that he'd be some doing some programming. He's actually going to come on tomorrow as a expert guest for the North America men's West field to talk about uh, the depth of field there that we've been doing over the past couple of weeks with some different regions. Um, but I have these vibes of 2016, 2017. 2016 was the first year that uh, Rich's team won at the CrossFit Games. Or actually, they had won in 2015. Although I still, I mean, NorCal was the best team that year. Everyone knows it, but they had an injury, so that Mayhem won. 2016, they won very handily. And they come back 2017, and suddenly you have this, this team that's out there with this hashtag, Stop the Mayhem. <laughs> the Wasatch Brutes, led by Conway. Their whole team was really good. Um, and you go to the games that year <clears throat> and it was basically every workout was first or second, second and first, first and second, second and first between those two teams. And it was just like these two, like, I would say that those two teams, those were still six person teams of the six person team era. Those might be the two best teams that ever competed at the games. Like it was really, really impressive. Every workout was just phenomenal. What they were, those two teams were doing. And they uh, ultimately, while Satch Bruce unseats the champions, the defending champions of mayhem that year, the only season that Rich competed team that he didn't win. So <clears throat> we'll see if it happens, but I could see very much having a similar storyline, even though it's not the same exact team from Invictus. It is the defending champions that will be uh, there. And then you have this really, really good contending team that's been put together to come and kind of, you know, upset that um, title potentially. Loud in life sports. All right. So that's just, I'm just going to throw that out there early in the year. You might end up, we might end up seeing a reminiscent games to 2017 where these two powerhouse teams are just trading blows the whole weekend. So we'll see. Um, but back on the, on the West side, um, <clears throat> I've been mentioning this thing. And then if people have been watching the leaderboard kind of closely, as far as I'm aware, there are three 
three teams from North America that have been basically removed from the leaderboard earlier today that were in qualifying positions. Um, all three of the teams are not necessarily uh, unfamiliar teams or affiliates, depending on where you're from. On the West, it was Kilo 2. In the East, it was the Grit House and also a team uh, ADM from ADM <clears throat> from Canada. And all of those teams were removed from the leaderboard because one of the members of their team had not done one of the open workouts at their affiliate. And we, we you know, in the rule book this year, I think much to CrossFit's credit, they have uh, minimized kind of the barriers to entry to having a team. In section 1.13 of the leaderboard, there's basically three bullet points. All the athletes on your team must be registered by March 4th. Super easy to, to, to meet that expectation. Each athlete must submit a score for all the open workouts. Makes, makes sense. And each open workout must be performed in the same physical location as the team's affiliate. It's still called the Affiliate Cup. So, you know, you can compete with anyone you want in the world, but you have to choose one affiliate. You have to travel there and you have to do all of the open workouts there. Um, <clears throat> there is another part of this here, the second thing underneath the three bullets. At any time during the game season, CrossFit may require athletes to produce documentation proving they have met the team requirements. To verify an athlete's eligibility, teams must be able to provide video evidence that includes each team member performance of their submitted score of all open workouts at their affiliate, on-screen verification of the date and time the workout was completed. They even provide a link, time.is, as a way that you can do that. So in my uh, estimation here, CrossFit has done a great job of laying out pretty easy to, to follow rules that all teams can should be able to um, adhere to and even a solution of how to do that timestamp thing just in case because obviously you don't need to submit all your open workouts, uh, videos, and those things, but you should have them. And if you want to have them, you also need the timestamp and they provide you a way to do that. So that's great. Um, <clears throat> talk to the, I, I spoke with at least someone from each of these three teams. In the case of Kilo, they didn't really have anything to say. One of the athletes did the first workout at a different gym. That's not within the parameters of the rules, so that's just unfortunate. Uh, ADM, from I believe one of their athletes was on vacation one week, did the same thing, so not good enough. for the to, Doesn't meet the requirements of the rules. And the teams should have been on top of that, of course. Like, you know, you, 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 those gyms know that they have good athletes. They know they have the potential. Like, they're competing to qualify for semifinals at the very least. So, you know, prior to selecting your quarterfinals roster, you should be checking that stuff, I think. Uh, ha, you know, <laughs> we know that the people that we're putting on a roster have actually done the workouts at our affiliate. It's literally the only thing they have to do. This is an and interesting nothing, one. Though. Go ahead. Nothing Pat. changed from nothing changed from last year in terms of that. So these teams, like you said, they're familiar teams. How they I don't know how they failed to do that, or I don't know, just something as simple as that. It just kind of maybe beyond me unless they're I doubt this I mean I don't want to assume that but unless they're trying to you know beat the system somewhere somehow and just make it to semifinals and they don't think that they're going to check quarterfinals but you know either way if that's if that's what really happened then they then what happened with them being disqualified removed from the leaderboard then rightfully so yeah well in the the last team that I haven't mentioned yet is CLT the grit house and I know these people really well they have the same athletes on their team that they've had for the past couple of years uh, Kevin Steinhaus, Caroline Klutz, Josh Harding, and uh, Stevie Dellinger. And when I heard this, I was like, "That the, like something is not adding up there." Like um, three of them co coach and or own and train at CLT Grit House and have for ever since it's been there. And then Stevie, I think, drives in from she lives maybe sixty or ninety minutes away, but she's been on their team multiple times. I also know that I mean. His name is, I think, even on the leaderboard, Dr. Kevin Steinhaus. Caroline Klutz is super, super, not just fit, but also intelligent. And I know these people, be seeing them and working with them at competitions, that they have no interest in skirting the rules or trying to find a way to work around or whatever. In fact, they're very much um, fans of having you know rules in place and whatever. <clears throat> and they get frustrated when they're following them and other people aren't, et cetera, just like you know anyone who, who's trying to do the right thing would do. So this one caught me off guard a little bit, and I was like, that's just so weird. I did get, have a chance to talk to Kevin today. Um, I think that they may put up a post at some point. But basically, Josh did the workout, uh, one, the week one workout at the affiliate, as did everyone else. He wasn't happy with his score. He redid it on Monday at the fire station where he works. And because there was no affiliate uh, at the fire station, he filmed it. 
he uploaded that video is a much better score. That score did not even register as one of the two best scores on their team. So it had no bearing on their qualifying for quarterfinals. And, um, but when they went to do the review process, which they, I believe that they did this for all of the teams, check to make sure that their athletes are meeting the requirements. They saw that he, he did that workout, not at their affiliate, just like they saw with the member of Kilo 2, just like they saw with the member of ADM. And um, the rules are pretty black and white, and his workout wasn't done there. So <clears throat> they removed them. Um, upon hearing this news, CLT Grithouse, you know, informed them of what went on. They sent the video of him doing that workout a couple days prior from the gym with the timestamp, as it was said. Um, and they said, you know, but that's not because it's, it says specifically in the rule book. Each team member's performance of their submitted score of all the open workouts. And the workout that Josh submitted was the one that was not done at the affiliate. And so black and white in the rule book, they did not follow the rules. And so the decision was upheld. That's so tough. But I do respect CrossFit for it. And I think something that CrossFit's done, in my opinion, well in the last few years is they have a, a rule and they have a standard. And if athletes don't, you know, adhere to it 100%, that's just no tolerance. And it's tough and no one likes the outcome of it, but the rule's the rule. So I think that there's a, I agree with you that in this case, they handled it right. And I do think that there are examples of them doing that well. I also think that there are examples of, of times that they haven't and that that's what's frustrating to people is that it's, you know, um, and I, I'm, I'm not, I was trying to think about the best way to kind of break these down. Uh, I think that in most circumstances, when it's written rules in the rule book, that they hold the line black and white and they do that very well. The ones that seem to be a lot more gray are how they assess penalties and movement standards, which are a lot more widespread. But uh, for example, I spoke to a team who was disputing um, deadlift extension. You know, and it's like most people know that like the extension on a deadlift has been a controversial movement uh, in reviews for a decade plus. You can go back to the Josh Bridges incident from whatever year that was. And then you have Dave Castro saying, uh, we're programming movements that are basic foundational movements and we're, and we're trying to make it easy on the judges. And so there's certain movements that are easier to judge than others. And some people would just push back immediately and say the deadlift's not one of those. You know, um, J.R. Hall said a few months ago, if you program deadlifts at less than 225 pounds for the pros, you're asking for trouble if you're doing online reviews. 185 in the open, 315 in the quarterfinals is a lot heavier. Still, these people are so freaking impressive. I mean, go back and watch that year of the open when they had Diane into heavy Diane, and you still see people just ripping deadlifts at 315. I mean, it's crazy how good these athletes are. It's hard to program an online competition. But this team told me they actually, the um, the review team out there, you know, they showed us that there were reps where we'd have full extension and reps where we didn't. Great. And I hate to bring this up, and I really don't really want to talk about it, but we saw the same thing with Rebecca Fusile's video in 24.3. There were reps where she had one range of motion. People freeze-framed it and showed it, and there were reps where she had another range of motion that was not the same, regardless of whatever movement limitations she might be citing. In that workout, you were able to see a range of motion that was met with some reps and not other reps. No penalty was, was given to her. She, that video upheld, and she was allowed to win the, that workout and money. And so that's where I would say that I don't know about the consistency because, um, you know, what you're doing here is different than what you're doing there. In this case, with the eligibility requirements, absolutely. It says it that way. That's why I wanted to pull up the leaderboard because specifically the way that that second bullet there, the first bullet in the second set of bullets is written, that's the one that applies to the grit house. Case closed. Sorry, guys. And that's an experienced team that's been to the games multiple times that knows what they're doing. They're not trying to cheat the system. And, and even their response to me when I, when they told me what there was the final call from CrossFit was, is like, I'm, we're, you know, like I said, I'm not surprised, but that sucks. And they said, neither are we. That's like that. That's in line with how they typically handle these things. So they understand it. Bummer for them. It's a great team <clears throat> that will be missing out. But the, the North America East uh, field for teams is super deep. So next man up is still going to be very good. Anyway, just wanted to kind of update you guys on uh, that in case you're fans of those teams. Or you were wondering why they weren't on the leaderboard or maybe you're a fan of a team who got a a bump up because of that. And just by the way, the scoring is not finalized. <clears throat> um, I think they gave themselves till April 15th, which is a week, which is what was advertised. Um, so they're going through those processes. The leaderboards have been changing, but let's, uh, yeah. let's go back. 
Final thoughts on kind of anything about that, Bella, Patrick? No, I like it. I think it's it's tough to see teams get disqualified that have the capacity to make the games and, you know, not just make the games, but do well. But it is it is what it is. So, Patrick, uh, pull up the um, spreadsheet again. And let's go to the rest of the world tab. You know, I've, I want to, uh, Bella, I want to also take the opportunity to ask you about, we're, we're going to start with Oceana. But before we talk My about Aussie the teams, teams in Oceana, you put up something on Instagram the yesterday or the day before. Yeah. Seemed like some pretty good news to me. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm going back to Torian, but this time I'll be doing the sideline reporting. And it'll be sideline, but also they want me to do kind of some on-the-floor commentary. So we'll be passing back and forth as things are happening on the floor. And I think that's exciting because you kind of get to use what you know and what you see as an MC on the floor. And then I get to share that with them because there's things that I notice from being on the floor at all of these competitions and commentating on what's happening that if you aren't always looking at all of these things, you wouldn't know. And then if you're not on the floor, there's a lot of things you don't get to see. So I think that'll be really fun. I'm stoked. I get to work with rookie and I mean, he's my dream teammate. So. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why in most sporting events, you have the commentators that are kind of an elevated perspective of some height. And then you have someone on the floor because there's things that you can only see on the floor. But also the floor is a limited perspective that the people up high have can see more of the big picture. And that generally makes a great team. Uh, you and Rookie, of course, are Jeremy Austin, for people who don't know. A great, great friends and great team. And um, I know that you have a huge passion for Australian Oceanic CrossFit New Zealand uh, <laughs> and a lot of friends over there. So that's amazing. Super happy They're for you. They're my family. I tell you what, like the Australian CrossFit community, they brought me in so quickly. And I think that's something that's really fun about, I mean, just the CrossFit community in general, but specifically out there. I came out there and I was the American and they just, they adopted me. They love me and they've become my family, whether it's in Brisbane or in Wollongong, it's, it's the entire country, even New Zealand too. So both, uh, but they're just some of the best people that I get to work with. So I'm very excited. Well, let's just take a quick look at some of those, <laughs> some of those teams. Um, it's, uh, in these uh, smaller regions, I would say, well, they all get the same number of teams to go to semis, but get less qualifying spots to the games. Um, mm -hmm. here's the top, top teams coming in. You have our side 64 army, um, seen them at the games before Torian mayhem, uh, obviously yes, EXF that raw iron mayhem thunder team, um, which have some familiar names on it. And you have seven Australian teams before you get to the top team from New Zealand. If you scroll to the right there, Patrick. I've kind of, uh, this is my own application of the knowledge that I have about these teams. Um, I would actually put a key all the way to the right over there. So if people can see what the um, colors look. So basically, uh, I really should probably put the blue one as the favorite or the favorites. That's the team that I would designate as a favorite to win in any given region. The other teams in purple, which are the ones that I feel like they should or probably will qualify if everything goes smoothly. Yellow is the kind of a group of, of teams that I would say if any of the, those other teams have a mistake, these are going to be the ones that take advantage of that. And then um, in this case, outside shot would go to orange. And then for some of the other divisions, you'll see some red ones as well. So even though they didn't finish, uh, the other thing is I like to see the points here because you can see kind of the gap 10 to 20 points, only a 10 point margin over four workouts in a quarterfinal, and then another 12 points to the team behind that. Um, it's obviously different tests, but it gives you a good kind of sample size of how close the margins are. But when I look at this, um, we'll ask Bella when she gets back. Patrick, you can weigh in as well. I think that I still think that team from Torian, even though they didn't win the quarters, is the team to beat at the semis. 100%. I think, you know, any team with Royce, I mean, that guy, he's been, you know, he's been involved in team. I mean, we know him as an individual athlete, but the guy's been, even when he's competed in individuals, He's competed in team events too. I mean, I think of uh, what was it? The, was it the French Throwdown back in 2020 or 2019, where he was trying to get that Mayhem team to semifinal or to the games where he competed on that team, but still was an individual. Um, I mean, Royce is obviously the the main person. And then you have Christy Bishop and Marnie Sykes. They're essentially like the Taylor Williamson and Andrea Nistler of Oceana. I mean. 
those two are, you know, they're, they're just, they're just, if you're going to put together a winning team out of Oceana, they got to have those two women on it. So, um, but um, yeah, that has to be the team to beat. And of course, you know, raw iron mayhem, you know, you have the experience athletes there. You know, I talked to Khan. It was a rough weekend for Khan. Those who follow Khan, um, he actually had a staph infection. And instead of, he, he used his version of WebMD where he showed, took a picture of it and asked everyone on Instagram what they thought it was. And everyone's like, dude, that's a staph infection. So, yeah. So he was doing all those work. He was doing his workouts just, yeah, sick as a dog and with a staph infection. And talking to him, he said that Emily DeRoy is healthy. You know, Kara is just Kara. And then James is just getting fitter. He's, he's, you know, he's doing CrossFit again. So he's really happy. And he's like, I, he's like, mate, I'm no, no, I mean, no lie here. I think I'm the weak one of the team. And that's saying a lot from Khan because he actually does say prior to this week, it's probably the healthiest he's been. Not the, not the strongest, but the healthiest he's been. But that strength is coming back. Hi, guys. I'm back. Yes, you are. <laughs> with, with thoughts. So, yeah. I think this is the first year that I've gone to Torian that the depth of the team's field actually to me is going to, I mean, it's going to be a battle to see who's standing on top of the podium and who actually gets qualifying spots to the games. Because if you're looking at all of these teams, they are all very seasoned elite competitors as individuals. Some of them have gone team before, but if you're looking at off season competitions, you're seeing a lot of familiar names that have, shown up and stood out in competition. So if you're looking at Owasside, Laura Clifton, Holly Heine, two phenomenal elite females, especially last year at Torian, Laura had a really great performance. Everybody knows Torian Mayhem. I mean, I've got a lot of faith in Royce. It's tough that Swanee's not on the team this year, but I think Jack is a great replacement. If you're looking at EXF, Moses, I just heard on Sunday that it's he's the fittest he's ever been. So that's freaking amazing. And then also he's with Jono and Jono, if you watched down under phenomenal performance right outside of podium. So I think they're also going to be fighting it out. Raw iron mayhem. I mean, everybody knows Khan. I think everybody knows Kara. Emily last year, rookie year for her. So I think she's, I wouldn't even say she's the odd one out on this team. If James can commit to training CrossFit, I think he's almost unstoppable. <laughs> I think it, I don't know if it was James or Khan. One of them. They might have put a collaborative, collaborative post up, but basically the the message was you can get really damn fit in eight weeks, and that's what I think yeah. that they're planning to do. Yeah, yeah, I think if James can just commit to training CrossFit full time, I think he will be a force to be reckoned with. But then, I mean, you're also looking at Tori and Grit, Riley Smith, um, who you know his brother competes, Katie Brock, Rachel Taomo Faumuina. Again, all of these athletes are very seasoned elite competitors. And I think this is the first time that you've seen this many names that competed at Torian last year as elite individuals that are trying to make it as a team. So I think that's very exciting and really fun. Now, do I think anyone will upset Torian Mayhem? I don't know. Likely not, because I have a lot of faith in Royce, but you never really know. And a lot of faith in Christy and Marnie. I think those girls continue to get fitter and fitter. And everybody knows your girls really are the ones that plug the holes for the guys. So I think it's going to be really fun. It would be also, you know, exciting to see a team from New Zealand qualify. If you want to know a fun story, Emily Julian actually was an RX athlete a year ago. Yeah. So she competed at New Zealand Nationals this year and it was her first like real competition. So if they make it, I mean, the fact that they're already making it to Torian in this pro field is pretty exciting. But if a team from New Zealand made it, that would be a pretty cool story for her. Yeah, and I think that especially, you know, for the men, we've we've kind of been referencing it in Oceania. There's the spots are just at such a premium. You have three guys that are in the top twenty in the world at, at the worst, <clears throat> um, and you know, obviously, to beat any of them is tough. But you have three spots on the team side, and it's another way to qualify and go represent uh, that part of the world at the games. I think this is going to be a really tight competition. The teams in blue and purple are the ones that I would pick right now, but all the teams in yellow, I think, have the potential to. Uh, make some noise if uh, if any, if anything goes wrong. So I say keep that, an eye on EXF. I'll say yeah, that. absolutely. I feel like they always get counted out a little bit. They obviously finished third here. You can see the points are pretty tight. Um, I do expect that we'll see 
as Patrick was kind of referencing, an elevated version of that uh, Mayhem Thunder team by the time that the semifinals hit. We can just uh, sc- just shoot down to South America real quick. I think it's actually supposed to be AR, uh, AR1. Not my fault there. I think Enter AB1 the- is Miami. Yeah. I'll change it real quick. Um, but they had a super impressive weekend, uh, finishing third worldwide. Um, was it second worldwide? I don't know. They changed it a couple of times. Six uh, points. They're behind Invictus. Third worldwide. Yeah. Um, third. Yeah. And basically, Piero, Santiago, and Molina Rodriguez have been on this team for a couple of years. They had a different athlete. They brought in Maria Camila Quintero, who is a, a much younger and I think at a more in prime stage of her career than their previous athlete. Um, this team is really good. Uh, they've been training together for a while. I mean, uh, Mel was arguably the fittest woman in in or one of the top two in Argentina for many years. Um, Piero and Santi easily could be qualifying as individuals and have you know the potential to be top ten fittest fittest men in uh, in South America in general if they wanted to compete individually. Uh, I don't think this team is going to have much of an issue getting to the games. Um, but it, it does remind me of the AB CrossFit team last year where they were so impressive at the semi and then just at the games, the level's just different. You get the best teams from around the world. So I don't know that the third place in the quarters will translate to a podium run at the games. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if like a perfect weekend yielded a, th- a threat for a top 10 spot. I think that would be like the optimal scenario for this team. Um, but we'll see. I mean, you never know, but I do, I, I think this team is really good. And I think after that, it's pretty wide open in South America. I don't know if you guys have any knowledge or thought about these teams. No, I agree with you. I think if you're going to be top five in quarterfinals, that shows that you belong to be there and you're going to, you know, you're going to stand out. But I think we always see the difference between one through 10 and then 10 through 20 and then the bottom. And I do think AR1 They've proven that they're a top 10 team. So if they can just hold on and do it again, when you know the elements are in play, when there's people watching, you're not in your own gym, things like that. There's a lot that goes into it. More things can go right when you're at your home affiliate. A lot can go wrong when you are at the will of Dave Castro. So, you know, I, I'm excited for them. I think it'd be really fun for a team from South America to be in the top five. So good luck to them. Yeah, that would be cool. The Templo SA team down there in the sixth, I, th- I believe they made the games last year. Um, and this is, um, it's. I think they're in that top six or seven, it's all Argentina and Brazil. They only get two spots. They're going to be tough to get, um, but it should be, I mean, if you go to the South America semifinal, you're not going to have a bad time <laughs> as no, a fan. It'll be have fun. <laughs> we have a pretty similar situation, I would say, in Asia, where there's one team over there that has kind of uh, emerged as the best team. Interestingly enough, though, they haven't listed any alternates on their team this year. Patrick and I have talked about it in the past, but the Kleshnikov team is like a, uh, it's like a breeding ground. It's like people just like flock there to train in Russia. Then they went to, they went to the UAE for a little bit and now they're back in Russia. Um, but those four athletes that you see there, Camilla Takaeva, we've covered her a bit this off season, fittest woman from Kazakhstan, podiumed at sand clash competed in a eurasia throwdown she, oh, she podium there as well um and i actually think that they announced a different member being on their team but camilla and i i think Ajan have gotten along really well they brought her in um this is a real this is a good team and if you didn't if you w- want to learn a little bit about uh, andre and alex you can go back and watch the sand clash coverage especially the last day there were just two moments where andre fedotov who's i mean the guy's got to be like five seven maybe 185 pounds and he's going head to head on two different workouts against Giannis Papadopoulos, who is on another team there, who's like 6'2", 230. <laughs> and it was awesome watching them go back and forth, just totally different body types, really representing like what you know different athletes can have success in CrossFit. But this is a really good team. Um, and I think the two teams right behind that are going to be in a battle to get the second spot out there. Patrick, you know Carlos pretty well. We've talked about him in the past, but I like. I think this Marvel Black team has a chance to upset the Yas team. I think they do if Carlos competes on that team, because Carlos right now, you know, he we'll see what happens at individual quarterfinals. Um, obviously, this is kind of like a backup, but if Carlos does well in the individual quarterfinals, I would predict that he will compete as individual individual at semifinals, and that they would go with an alternate on the Marvel black mayhem team, you know, Carlos 
Carlos would be one of the favorites, you know, but would be a contender for the individual semifinal of Asia if given that opportunity. So that's something to keep an eye out. If Carlos is is a part of that team, he's definitely, I mean, them and Yaz Blue. Obviously, Yaz is they got a, a uh, they have a history. There are some really really fit people there, so it, it'll be interesting. But yeah, it's had it's the Kalisnikov team is uh, shoulders above. I think last year that they're. Um, that the team they had last year, I think they won all but one event in the uh, semifinals um, in Asia. So they pretty much dominated all the way through. Yeah, and they won all four events at the uh, quarters this year. So, yeah, that'll be yeah. And then, but I, Carlos is listed as their team captain, so we'll see. Changrim An, I've also uh, know is pretty pretty talented. He probably could make it in the individual field if he wanted to. But mm-hmm. a couple of good teams there. Um, and Asia does usually have a couple of good teams coming up. Um, yeah. And then lastly, we have Africa of these countries. I uh, checked in with a friend of mine down there to get the, the rosters for all these teams. Um, but again, you see the points there. Tiger Valley seems to be the team to, be, to beat. Uh, what happened in Africa? All teams making semis. They ended up having more teams register than uh, would qualify. I think it was 34 or 36 and 30 will go. So most of the teams who, who registered for quarters uh, will also be at the semifinals. Um, but when you're looking at teams that can potentially make the games, I would say this is kind of the, that's probably it for them. Um, and probably it'll be one of the top two teams. I know uh, Baron Smith and Janie, I think she changed her name. I'm not sure if it's Ensign or Peniel now. Uh, I don't know the other two on that team, but on the team below them, Hungry, Humble Hungry, well, I have a typo there. Um, I've se- I've heard of Damian Burns, Jacko Burtz, Mariska, and Mariska Smith, which is good yeah. news. Yeah. And I ported all this information yesterday. I don't have a few typos. It's all right. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, um, I, I do agree with you with the the Tiger Valley. Um, I mean, they, they've they've always been contenders ever since we started the whole semifinal, you know, semifinal format. They're always up there in the top three, and they they've yet to make an appearance. And um, you know, it, it it'd be really cool to see them there. I know they're hard workers. So, um, yeah, something I did want to bring up regarding that AR team. Um, I didn't know that, but the AR that's that's Augustine Rochelle May's gym, and that's hence, hence AR one. So he's um, he's I guess you know he's on their team as an alternate. I think he's yeah. planning to compete uh, individually, but yeah. individual, but yeah, that's but yeah. So so those who wonder like AR, you know, it stands for uh, you know his it, those are his initial of his affiliate that he has in Argentina. So um, you know, obviously those are some hot, you know if they're training with augustine every day you know and these are some i mean we all know melina rodriguez and sante and so these are they're 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 a pretty good team i would like to see that team i would like to see a team from south america kind of make some noise at the games you know um you know it's just one of those things kind of like with asia i mean i think the kalisnikov team always has the potential to make some noise at the games it's just for they seem like they just have unfortunate accidents you know or injuries or something that happens and then obviously you know south Af- or africa the region of africa i'd like to see a better performance who knows the team they had last year that ended up getting disqualified that had some really good games you know for, they had what michelle uh, moran was on that team and they had some other you yeah. know good individual qualifiers on that team you know it's unfortunate because they might have maybe may, maybe hit that top 30 so but yeah, the rest of the world, I think it's very, it's um, it's pre, it's it's interesting, you know. Obviously, Oceania and then Asia, you know, the Kalisnikov team; those are the teams that probably contend for top ten spots. BC, flip back over to North America West. We had two um, two teams from Underdogs compete over there, uh, and you know those guys pretty well. Mm-hmm. Service Dogs, I think, took ended up fourth, and then fourth. the Rhino They're Dogs two spots fourth. below that. Yeah, they were tied for fourth um, and uh, I think 11th overall. And uh, obviously that's the team. If you look at the team and uh, Bella, you you might have some information as well. But uh, Mitch McClune, uh, people might know him as the spouse of of Carrie Pierce. Uh, Aww. They, yeah, I mean, but that, he loves he's it. He's his he own person. It. Mitch wears it, though. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's but so he's funny. his own person. Yes. Man, Mitch is very, very fit. Um you know that guy's fit, and I think this is this is not even the best version of their team out of quarterfinals because Mitch did have surgery and he's still not a hundred percent. 
CJ Gerald, he's uh, and this is funny because Mitch and CJ, they're both 30 somethings. You know, CJ is this is probably the fittest we've ever seen of CJ. Uh, I believe what did he, did he finish fifth at Wadapalooza this year? I don't think fifth, but he's he had a yeah. great he's had a great, great last 12 months. Um, yeah, <clears throat> we won't talk about him in the men's Westfield tomorrow because he's going to be competing on the team. But like if he was competing in that individual field, he would be relevant, relevant there. Yeah. 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 But those two guys right there, I mean, there's a like CJ being the fittest since he came, you know, since he's followed the underdogs programming, Mitch is fit to begin with. And, and he's, you know, he's still dealing with that injury, not a hundred percent, but it's the girls. It's Ava George and Carson Wolf. Um, they're both. I mean, Carson's 21, Jave, Ava's 20, 20 years old, about to turn 21. These two girls, baby I mean, girls. Carson, Jeez. pardon? They're just baby girls, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing. I mean, they both at a young age as teenagers, they moved from the Midwest, a, a Carson from Illinois um, and Ava from Wisconsin moved out to Las Vegas as teenagers to train full time under Kiefer, Kiefer Lamy's, um, uh, mentorship and um carson made semifinals last year uh had had some good events it was a great learning experience for her she had she had a, a really good event in the uh, the snatch i believe um ava just missed out on it but she was still you know just dealing with the culture shock so they've had a year and brian you saw ava compete compete at iron games and she finished second to chloe wilson um and then you know yeah she was giving her a run for the money right up to the final yeah, workout the final event yeah, and and these are teenagers. And I mean, not teenagers. They're 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 both not even twenty two yet. They both can't they can't legally rent cars yet. Uh, but um, I think they're they're someone to keep. They're they're a team to look out for. I think it's a good mixture. And if and I think Ava and Carson, if they decide to pursue team as a as as something like Taylor Williamson and Andrea Nissler kind of become that duo. I think they could have a really long career if they decide to go that route. But I think ultimately they would like to go individual at some point. So, and then um, the Rhino Dogs. That's a it's a it's a team that competed last year. Was probably nothing embodies underdogs in that team last year. Um, I think they were the final team in both team cuts, and they made it. It came down to the last event for the cuts each time. And that captain uh, Roth Duran who's a, a games veteran also coming back from injury the last couple of years, a devastating injury. Actually, uh, he actually happened because of Castro. He was testing out a workout for Castro and, and completely like ruined his wrist tore like every tendon and ligament, I believe. But, um, you know, he's back captaining this team and they did really well. Um, especially with the team, uh, that kind of was thrown together kind of last minute. And, uh, they're really ta talented. And some of those names, Brian, you actually are familiar with some of those names. Um, so, but yep. yeah, Nikita Yundov, uh, he, he was at the European semifinal last year. He had to withdraw with a little, a pec injury, I believe, but mm -hmm. he was, uh, I actually put him in touch with the guys from underdogs as he's moved out there. He's been thriving and loving it there. He was, I think displaced a little bit after during because of the war that's going on in yep. Ukraine. So it's nice to see him land on his feet and have a place that's kind of taken him in. And then Alina Ward and Emily Torres both were, um, you know, competitors at different competitions that I covered over the last year. So <clears throat> kind of uh, threw this team together, but it's a pretty talented team. All of them have good competition experience, and it seemed like they had a really nice weekend as well. So I think this is, again, a team that will get better as the season goes on. Yeah, those two teams, they they did the quarterfinal workouts, you know, side by side. And it's interesting, Rhino Dogs, uh, uh, Roth's team, they actually beat the Service Dogs team uh, out of three of the four workouts. But the Rhino Dogs, had uh, they had a really good uh, – a really, really good workout where they placed really well. And uh, that, that ultimately what was the difference between their placings. But, um, and if you're wondering why they're called the service dogs, it's because uh, Mitch is in the, uh, he's in, he's in the space force reserve. <laughs> and yeah. Ava George is, I mean, he's, Mitch is essentially like a rocket scientist, apparently. I mean, <laughs> but, and Ava's in the uh, army national guard in Las Vegas. So that's hence the service dogs. They, they kind of came up with that to kind of pay homage to, to those two team members and their service to the country. Yep. So those are some of the top teams out West. We'll see, uh, we can just scroll down to see the rest of the list, but basically uh, with the, the, the team spots are at a premium this year in North America, only 30 teams qualify. I believe only eight make the games. Um, and it's, I mean, it's going to be tough. There's a ton of experience here. I did want to just give a shout out to Mexico in general. Uh, obviously. Well, fact. The, 
you know, Roldan Goldbaum is uh, one of the best guys in Mexico that's competing with Invictus. But you had three teams from Mexico, uh, the Wolfpack, uh, well, the, the first Wolfpack team or Caratero team, they finished 10th. Then they had a team that was also 12th. And then they had a team that was 18th, Absolute Dopardus. Um, checked in with our friend Andy down there in Mexico to get some information about the teams. But, you know, Mexico's on the rise. Uh, don't be surprised. We'll talk about Luis Oscar Mora tomorrow. Uh, they have some fit dudes on there. They have some fit teams that are going to be in the mix, but there's a lot of experience on these teams out West between, you know, team density. I think this is their final run with Marco and Casey. That's a really good team. They have Brooke, uh, brought Brooke Haas on the team this year. Verdant, Einhorn, um, Lumberyard, J uh, Jason Carroll's Jim CrossFit Kema, who's always in, in the mix. Undefeated's bringing back the same team as last year. Lone Star CrossFit, Lone Star. some dudes army, Omaha, Coda Iron View. I mean, it just goes on and on with teams, Kinesis Black, that like we've seen Franco's Avengers that we've seen have success, you know, over the years. Um, so, you know, it's if you're a fan of team competitions, you know, the, the 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 entire field here is full of really, really capable and impressive athletes. Um, and you'll get some good performances here and there. But to make the games is it's it's a different level on the team side this year. Like you're gonna have to have a really good um, balance of chemistry, teamwork, execution, and fitness uh, on game day. We're going to actually have a, a, a show next week with um, someone from Europe, someone from the Oslo Krieger team camp over there. One of their coaches is going to join us to kind of break down a little bit more um, some of the team stuff in Europe. Uh, but let's look Brian, forward to NA East. Brian, were you yep. were you surprised that Omnia wasn't that didn't put it together a team this year? <clears throat> Um, they, I knew that, I knew that their team that had been going to the games every year was going to uh, disband, I believe. And I, sometimes I get confused. We'll see tomorrow, but I think Jacob, I think Jacob's competing this year. He's going to give a run individual yeah. and Cooper maybe retired, uh, the guys that were on their team. Um, so I, I actually kind of knew that they wouldn't be bringing back the same team this year. Yeah. It was just kind of weird just looking and not seeing the names you typically see over the last couple of years, the, the Omnias, the Kilos and stuff like that. Obviously the Kilo because of a unfortunate, fortunate incident, but then, you know, you see the Invictus teams and then now you're seeing like some of these other teams that, that you know, we know the underdogs coaches really well. They really wanted to get a team that properly that represented them. And now they got two and yes, Kiefer is very biased, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, before we move on, I just, you know, dagger, Carson Wolf is a badass name. She sounds like a Marvel character. And uh, yeah. rumors that they have a bad girl shrieking him, though, out there <laughs> illegally renting cars. <laughs> All right. Those fake IDs, you know. But um, just to rent cars. Uh, yeah, so North America East. Boom. Yeah, flip over to the East. Obviously, we know the Invictus team did great. Actually, the teams that are listed two, three, and four on this list, we'll we'll get to see a chance to see them compete head to head before the semifinals. All three of those teams are on the roster for Crash Crescendo, which we'll be talking about. Uh, we'll be covering that in a couple weeks. Uh, it's a great training opportunity for these teams leading into um, semifinals. But uh, I mean, that team, Ocean State team that they've put together this year, is really, really good. Uh, obviously, Ethan Helbig has yeah. individual games experience. Christine Best as well. Uh, Christine Middleton has been a, a career-long team athlete. She's broken some weightlifting records, but her fitness is uh, also incredible. And Josh Mattis missed out on the games last year because of a uh, face injury um, with his team, but they've picked him up. And this, I mean, this is a this is a really good team. Like this is a team that I think as they compete more together, I think it's a good decision for them to go to crescendo. By the time we see them at uh, semifinals, I think they'll be dialed in and even better at the games. Just want to kind of throw it out to you guys terms of ocean state mayhem those two teams in particular how good do you think that these teams can do this year go ahead bella i think they're gonna do i think they're gonna do very well i think ethan every single time i've seen him he's gotten fitter and fitter and so he's one of those athletes i love to see that he's on the team because i think he'll really thrive on a team especially mm -hmm. being with christine well, both christines um i would say cross with mayhem i mean y'all know where my allegiance is <laughs> and I think Angelo has done a really phenomenal job following in Rich's footsteps, creating these teams that not only embody Mayhem values and that they're proud to represent Mayhem, but I think the team gets fitter and fitter. Um, sad to see Kyra not on the team this year, but I'm stoked for her to be an individual athlete. I mean, I think she's fitter now. So I'm excited to see what she's going to do as an individual, but having Molly McGrandy on the team as the replacement for Kyra they're going to be unstoppable. I think when we were talking about teams that are going to be close to the podium, at least top five, 
I think this CrossFit Mayhem team has that potential as well. Yep. And yeah, uh, Andrew, know. Sam, and Zoe now having an, another year working together. And we know that that chemistry does make a difference, especially when the margins are small at the top. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I talked about that, um, that Roth's team uh, underdogs last year. Well, two of those team members, obviously, that he had on that team that did so well that kind of overperformed was Ethan and Christine Middleton. Um, so seeing them back together, but that whole team has games experience, whether on a team or individual, you know, Christine best, uh, she made the games. It was the COVID year, but uh, she's, you know, she competed on a team last year with one of the brutes. Uh, no, it was the uh, move fast lift heavy team. Um, you know, they, you know, that competed out of the East. So she got some team experience and obviously Josh, you know, he's no stranger to team competition, but like you said about Ethan, I, I totally agree. Ethan, who, you know, made the, made his debut at the games as a, as a young individual. And, you know, he's now just, he's, he's just grown into this really just all round athlete. And then Christine Middleton might be, you know, I mean, I consider one of the, the strongest women in CrossFit. I, I really would love to see her and like Danny Spiegel kind of go one-on-one -on -one in some of these Olympic lifts, like especially well, Laura Horvath Let's throw her and, or, or snatches. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been able to watch, I've seen Chris, Christine Middleton competing at, uh, at, you know, Olympic lifting events and she, she can hang, she can hang there. You know, she, she finished, um, I think three years ago, like third in USA national. So for mayhem, you know, like Bella, so eloquently put, you know, Angelo is the El Capitan, you know, he's assumed that role from, from uh rich. And I'm not saying that because he has a sweet mustache, um, but uh, he, um, yeah, I mean, everyone, it kind of went viral in CrossFit is they'll, they'll do good. As long as Bennett Looper's not around the clock, uh, they'll do really well. Um, oh my gosh. I actually <laughs> talked to Bennett yesterday and we, oh. we chat on the phone for a while and I said, dude, I heard you're looking for a new job <laughs> or you got fired, man. Yeah. If you haven't heard, you know, or has seen the video, go to Angelo. And I think rich, rich has probably the best rich posted the oh. best because it shows Angelo going through this bleeping just, yeah. It's, it's I just like, he's just like, stop, stop, stop. Yeah. My favorite part of that is Bennett's reaction. Like he know he messed up and he just like, I walk, he walked away, but he didn't want to walk away. But I mean, just great job. Obviously that was a tough workout that, uh, that could have been potentially been, I don't know what round they were in, but that was one of the, the longer war workouts, the 50, 30, 20 total bars. And um, was it thrusters? So, um, but that shows you what type of person probably that not. Angelo yeah, is. Yeah, like probably not planning to do that one a second time. Yeah. Yeah. They probably were not, but he, that's the type of person is he's fully aware. Like that's one thing about Angelo is like that guy, his knowledge of CrossFit as a competitor and just all around, just knowing, I mean, that's one thing I think Kyra mentioned is like, you know, that workout when they won that first workout at the games, when no one else, when there was no one else, I mean, paying attention to them and everyone was looking at the, you know, teams in the middle lane they came back and won that just shows angelo with the whole time was like we can win this we can win this they're falling apart they're falling apart and you know angelo's just you know he's the el capitone and it, it's a really good team and molly molly mcgrandy is a really good uh a really good um replacement for kyra or filling in for or moving into that role that kyra had and then zoe zoe's just she's just solid all around all around so yeah I and mean, speaking of solid all around this this roster in the east is crazy i mean uh, yesterday yeah. when I was just gathering information from these teams, you know, I must have heard from 15 of them that are basic, basically saying, like, we're coming for a game spot. And in every single case, I was like, yeah, you could make the games. But there's only eight spots. I mean, we thought that it was a premium in the East last year when there were only 10 teams. Um, <clears throat> I don't, you know, we don't have time to go through and say everything positive that I have to say about every team on here. Sure. Uh, that reignited team will be at, at Crescendo. That Levi's Mayhem team, that's Alexander Caron's gym. That's a really good team. Um, the CrossFit 1124 is actually, they're probably a good follow on Instagram. They are hilarious. Uh, my kids. Fun. Those are my friends. That yeah. team is a team that I'm very interested in this year. They have um, a ton of fitness. Great. It seems like they have great chemistry. And they also have this thing that the Omnia team from years past has have. They're all basically the same height. Like there's not a, a great discrepancy there, which when it comes to team workouts can be massively advantageous. There's other teams that can make it work. Not like that, but they'll be pretty good. And you see, I have just a huge group of people in purple there. It's more teams than can qualify for the games that I think mm -hmm. like every one of those teams should be at the games. 
um, in terms of if you're looking for the best 30 teams or 30, whatever it is in the world, they would all be there. Um, they can't all make it. And then most of the teams that are on yellow also would be great fits at the games as well. Um, and you're talking about serious, serious team, you know, t- training think tank, Milford Black, Three Kings, PSC Invasion, 12 Labors, 10 Skills, like CrossFit. Like these teams are putting teams out that are competitive year after year after year. Many of them are getting better uh, as they develop more chemistry, more experience in competition, whatever. Um, yeah, it is a absolutely stacked field. I would highly encourage you guys to, uh, I think five t- teams will be at Crescendo and then all these teams will obviously be at the East. But if you like team competition, you know, the East is where it's at. It's it's crazy. Yeah, shout out shout out to our girl, Sydney Smith. You brought up Chris CrossFit 1124. But yeah, Sydney, she's an uh, up and comer. And uh, I think her and Brooklyn are, they're like a perfect pairing for, you know, like just you know, if you want a solid base for your females on a, on a team, those are two good ones and they're up and comers, especially Sydney. So shout out to her. And, um, technically a mayhem met- athlete now. Yeah, true. She is. She true. She is. Yeah. She's, she's made a couple of visits. Is Dom her coach now? Um, no, she has another coach, but. Okay. But like Brian said, you, you know, go down here. I mean, the CrossFit new England team, it has, uh, you know, Katrina, uh, I think it's DJ Como. Digia Como, I think. Digia Como, she she's coming off a really impressive open, and then Tori Dyson. If those, she's it's great seeing Tori Dyson um, competing on a team. Uh, this is something I thought she yeah. should have made done done a while ago, especially with the talent level they have across with New England. But uh, it's cool to see her, and uh, you know she's one of those athletes that's kind of well known in the CrossFit space, but he's yet to make the games. So this could be her best chance of making the games, especially uh, you know as she's kind of a progressed, you know, in in the sp- Sport. we're gonna skip over europe on uh, monday <clears throat> we're gonna go through the european teams with uh Simon aslund from uh norway and so we'll deep do a little deep dive on the european teams there and evaluate the depth of the field um but if you scroll down there patrick i just did want to recognize the countries um at the bottom it's just right below that basically uh, sp- i'm counting spain as six and a half countries they do it the their top team okay. has no Spanish athletes in it and three Swedish athletes. So I gave them a half point each. Six and a oh. half for Spain, four teams from Norway, all of the Oslo uh, Krieger, Sweden, three and a half teams, Denmark, three, UK, three, Italy, three, Germany, two, Finland, two, France, two, Netherlands, one. Nice uh, spread of, of teams there. Um, and if you're interested in the team competition in Europe, uh, we're going to go pretty deep in the weeds and, and talk about uh, what this might look like in Lyon, France in a month or so. Patrick, I only got like three to five minutes left. Then I go sure. coach at the gym. I know there were a couple yep. other things that you might have wanted to bring up. Uh, no, actually, no, I, I think that's it. Unless, was there something I wanted to talk about? I don't remember. I yeah, thought I, I had sent you a couple of things, but you know, say love. Did you? I don't know. I'm, I'm like, today's been, what is that? I don't know what that it's is. It's in our that's text message fault. thread. Inshallah, you know, if God's will, like exactly. We'll Inshallah, exactly. Everyone's. We don't have to talk about it. I just thought it was it was a, a cool study that um, Halpin had done earlier in the oh, week. Oh yeah, about just uh, year over year growth from the open. Uh, and there's the the main reason I wanted to bring it up is because I I actually often get asked this: what is you know what is happening with CrossFit in North America compared to the world? Because obviously CrossFit was mm-hmm. started in North America, a majority of the champions and podium athletes and top 10 athletes historically have come from the U S and Canada. Uh, and then there's, you know, obviously there's been some other countries that have had some big success, but it, you know, a big percentage of the population is coming from that's competing in this sport is coming from North America, but you'd expect that to be changing over time. And, um, <clears throat> did you find it, Patrick to show the graphic or you're still looking for it? No, because I don't want to screw up my internet. <laughs> no, oh, okay, fair me. enough. Yeah. Well, I'm basically, afraid touch, I'm afraid if I touch anything, stuff will be like, you know. Yeah, yeah. I Don't found mess a around sweet, with that. I found a sweet spot. I found a sweet spot. I'm keeping it right now. You know. So, but basically, there were 4,800 additional participants from North America this year as compared to last year, and as far as the rest of the world goes, there were 16,000 more. So it's about, uh, it's almost a, you know, three and a half yeah, or four times world. greater increase around the world. And when you look at when you break that down by continent, 4,800 in North America, 7,400 more in Europe, 7,400 more in South America, 2,100 more in Asia, only 150 more in Oceania. 
and a negative 1,100 in Africa, which is almost entirely due to the Arab Open that's happening counter to the uh, CrossFit Open this year. Um, but, you know, I think as expected to see the growth uh, internationally, and it's a really positive thing. And when Mike and I were talking, the main thing that we kind of said is that doesn't look like a sport that's dying to told, me. I was told to draw the graphic. This is what it looks mm -hmm. like. Just <laughs> there it is. More that, people. That's it. Helping, helping, wasting all that time on spreadsheets when <laughs> Bella's got that got it down. That is awesome. Yeah. There we go. Hey, by the no, way, but, Bella's gonna sign that, and we're gonna give that away as a giveaway. So oh. yeah, if you want to sign original art piece from this <laughs> Bella Martin, you know, just like and subscribe to the channel. <laughs> but uh, you know, I did want uh, before you go. You did mention this, so um, here we go about the heat. So uh, mm. we won't get too deep into it, but basically the PFAA, they, in advance, great job by PFA in advance. They, they yeah. sent some questions regarding the heat and what to expect at the CrossFit games and the CrossFit actually responded. Um, how they responded might be a different story, but, uh, but um, yeah, basically they said that the competition will feature one primary field of play indoors in Dickey's arena. We all knew that a much smaller percentage of events than Madison will occur outdoors. So, Basically, it's saying that there will be some outdoor events in in Texas. We just don't know how many because it was kind of like maybe 30 percent, maybe even up to 50 percent were outdoors in Madison in some years. So for those who think it's going to be all indoors, apparently, yeah, it's not going to happen. There's no pool in Dickies. So no, there is there is not nor, nor a lake. But yeah, I mean, we've we've kind of referenced this, uh, you know, Hopefully, with the move to the new venue, the thing that's not lost from the CrossFit Games is the ability to test road biking, long distance running outdoors, and maybe in, with elevation changes, um, softball uh, throwing, sw swimming, pushing sleds, you know, uh, moving out objects in, in battleground type events, you know, uh, obstacle courses. Like these things are part of the identity of the CrossFit Games that I think it would be really sad to lose. While Dickey's Arena is super versatile in terms of what they can do inside of it alone, I think if you didn't have anything outside of there, you would be kind of sacrificing a certain element of the games that people have come to love. Um, Heat has played an issue, a role in past CrossFit Games. Athletes have changed the way that they prepare for the games to uh, accommodate that by coming earlier or going to specific spaces where they train in similar climates. Um, and I think it's totally fine to have some workouts outside. Now, it would be probably irresponsible to have Murph at one, 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. But if you schedule, um, you know, some kind of, a, an, you know, even if it's an hour-long event that's starting at 7 a.m., uh, you know, on a Saturday morning, I'm not going to have an issue with that. Like that's something that I think that athletes can can and should be expected to do at the game. So find that the PFA is expressing some concern about it. Um, I think it's probably unnecessary. I think that the games team has enough experience and is uh, sensitive enough to this issue to probably be, be accounting for it either way. Yeah. But Bella, that's your neck of the wood, Texas. So you, you, you know how it is. So, it's going to be yeah. hot. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be hot. It's going to be hot. But it's all right. There's a ways around the heat. And uh, I think that's it, Brian. We'll let you go. Um, there was one question, but, you know, sorry, Sarah Cooper, we weren't able to get to your question. So ask, ask the question. It's fine. Okay. Do we think it's Noah versus Carr versus one of the Invictus teams when it comes to the team no. events? No. No. It's Noah versus the Invictus teams. Yes. Carr's team, maybe top 10. Yeah. Yeah. That I would agree. So it's, a, but again, I think it's you're going to have five teams competing for that that podium spot, which is going to make it fun. I will yeah. say this: we talk about, uh, uh, you know, many of these teams will improve as the season goes on, and there may be no team up. that improves more than Kara's team as the season goes on. But to get to the, you know, to get to the level that those other two teams are at, you can't you can't just start training seriously for that at this point, regardless of having. You know, a decade plus of uh, training age that Newberry and Porter have. You're, yeah. I mean, you're talking about. I mean, I know people are calling it Noah, but um, if you didn't get the message from Noah and Chandler at Wadapalooza, like, <laughs> do not underestimate how freaking fit Tola Morakino is. This so guy is fit. an absolute savage, and he's yep. only getting better. Um, Lena Richter is as good of a team athlete on the female side that we've seen, top five all-time team athlete in, amongst females, and Matilda Garnes is a, you know. She's if she's not qualifying for the games as an individual, it's a surprise. 
It's not, a, you know, so this is and like, she has team. She's competed on a team at the games. Yeah. So you're not just, you know, uh, while I think that that team that car is on can improve and can f- make a run, make a top 10 run. It's a totally different question to ask if they can compete with a team like that. Yeah. And I will I say that. I might. Yeah. While I was one that really surprised me, but we'll talk about that, but I will say as well as they Noah's team or that 360 team, I'm going to call it the 360 team. Cause I don't want to be screamed at like Brian was, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, that Invictus team is going to get better because they were shorthand. Joshua Alchama was on his deathbed during quarterfinals. You know, they just threw in a new, you know, Jesse Smith, who has been training with them. Still, it's a little bit different when you're training, when you have all four team members competing under that, 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 those circumstances. So that Invictus team, don't look at the the point differential on quarterfinals. It, it's just going to get better. And I think when semifinals comes around, we'll have a better indication of where their fitness is at. So, mm-hmm. but that's it. All right, Brian, get out here. Bella, uh, go do beach running, whatever Bella things. It is Wednesday. Thing. It's it run club day. day. Exactly. That marathon training, that Dom's on program yeah, that you're doing anyways. <laughs> but um, we, again, shout out to HCR CBD for being our sponsors as always. Remember to use friend 20 at checkout for 20% off. Uh, thanks again, Carl, for all your support. Uh, keep a lookout. I think we have some cool HGR things coming out in our newsletter. If you're not signed up to our newsletter yet, maybe some other offers and different codes, some activations. So, you know, thanks a lot, uh, Carl, for being a part of it. Thank you, AGR, for supporting us and our recovery needs. Um, with that being said, Brian, Bella, you don't have anything else to say, so I'm going to sign us off and say be friendly, our friends. <laughs>